I'm with Michael Mistrata from Fellowship of Israel Related Ministries, and we're talking about the holiday of Yom Kippur. Now, Michael, what is Yom Kippur? Thanks for having me back, Paul. Yom Kippur is the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. Uh, it's the Day of Atonement. That's what Yom Kippur is, means. It's the Day of Atonement. And it's written about in Leviticus 23. You can read about it. Many people have heard it as well. And it's unlike all other Jewish feasts and festivals. Almost all of the other days of the Lord, the appointed times, the Jewish festivals, there's lots of eating, lots of food, lots of celebration. In fact, it's a, a required thing to, to celebrate. Uh, and Yom Kippur is not like that. It's actually very different. Yom Kippur is a, is a solemn assembly. It's a coming to, uh, together, and the Jewish people actually fast on this day, which is very rare. It's hard to get a Jewish person to fast, but this day is a day that all, most Jews will fast. Everything will shut down, even more so than on a Shabbat. On a Shabbat, people don't do any work, but Yom Kippur takes that to another level. Uh, cars will not drive in the streets in Israel, especially in Jerusalem. You can actually go stand on the highway. Like the, you see people going out to the highway and everyone will dress in white. And it's a time of really, really deep introspection. So we go through several different prayers where we're looking in, in our thoughts, in the way we act and what we say and what we speak and, and our pride. We're, you're evaluating these things and repenting before the Lord as kind of a last day before that book of life closes. We've talked about the book of life. We've talked about that book of life and the book of life during this time is what our hope is as we go into the new year we have a time where we're asking god for forgiveness and that he would remember us that he would put our name in the book of life mm. and so jewish people especially in israel will go around and say may your name be inscribed in the book may your name be found in the book and uh that's something that they say as a saying but it's this hope that again this is your one time of year where god turns his ear extra close to his people to hear their cry and to hear them cry out for forgiveness. So this is a biblical holiday, so you'll be able to find this holiday in the Bible, won't you? Correct. You know, in Leviticus 23, it talks about it from verse 26 to 32. It actually says, this is a day that you are to afflict yourselves. And this is a very uh, key phrase that they take in Judaism, afflict yourselves. People would define that differently. Uh, for most people, that means definitely fasting. And fasting, and if you're a Christian, maybe you fast in different ways. This is a complete and total fast. This is no food, no water. It's not a juice fast. Uh, and in many ways, they'll fast even from other pleasures. So they won't shower on this day. Uh, they won't wear uh, leather shoes. They won't wear certain shoes with mixed fabrics. They will dress in white. We'll dress in white. A lot of people will go to either the Kotel, the Western Wall, or somewhere, a, a local synagogue, and have a whole day of prayers and repentance where you go through 19 different uh, aspects of how to think about what your actions from the last year and repent for them. And then there's even a prayer at the end where it says, God, if I've forgotten anything, I ask that you would uh, forgive me for any sin that I've committed that I can't even remember. It's a very, very deep and serious time. Mm -hmm. That people won't even brush their teeth. Again, it's this, it's this mindset of afflicting yourself, of coming before the Lord in repentance and weeping. And at the end of the holiday, then there is a celebration. Usually there's a gathering with a family where they'll have a big pot of soup. They'll break the fast after sundown. It's a 25-hour fast. So from sundown on the night before Yom Kippur to sundown on the night of Yom Kippur. And then the families will come together fast and that will be the closing and essentially the, the starting of a new year. And we'll go into then the next feast, which is much more celebratory. Uh, what does the high priest do during Yom Kippur? Well, the high priest during Yom Kippur, it's the one time of year where they're able to go into, traditionally with the temple and with the tabernacle, where they're able to go into the Holy of Holies. And some of you may have heard the tradition where that was the one time where the high priest would go in and no one else can go in other than the high priest. That was the only time of year that he would bring the supplications of the people of Israel before God. And when you enter the presence of God, you had no idea what was going to happen. So they would actually tie a rope around the high priest's leg and put some bells on the rope. And so just in case when he walks in before God and things don't go so well, if he falls dead, they could pull him out and no one else has to go in to the Holy of Holies. It's the one time of year where they had that kind of access to God. And only one person, a representative, would take the sins of the people. And I think this is symbolic for us as believers because we know that Yeshua, Jesus, 
is our high priest. And he is also the one that brings our sins, takes our uh, prayers before God. He's, you know, we, we hear from the, the New Testament that he always lives to make intercession for us, that he's sitting at the Father's right hand interceding for us, that he is our high priest and our advocate that we go through to get to the Father. And now we have that access all the time. But it is this very, very heavy and serious holiday. And only this one time a year were, uh, was the high priest allowed to go in. And there's, of course, there's two goats and one of them is sacrificed, isn't it? Correct, yes. Yeah, so there's two goats. Um, one of the goats is sacrificed. And the other goat, the high priest lays his hands on this goat and sends him. Then that goat is carried into the wilderness. And they, usually what they do is they put him on a cliff and they'll push the goat off a cliff or have him fall off a cliff, and that he would, so that he would never return back to the people because they believe that the, the sins of the people of Israel are placed on the goat. And this is, this is a symbolic uh, substitutionary atonement, imputation, all these doctrines we believe. This wasn't a new idea when Jesus came or when Paul wrote about it in the New Testament. This was a very Jewish, very ancient concept that comes out of the Old Testament. Now today there is no temple, so there is no sacrifice. So how do they deal with sin today? You can't put it on a goat. You know, that's a good question. And many Jews would differ with their opinions on this. During the time of Yom Kippur, you will see some of the most orthodox Jews actually waving a chicken over their head. And, uh, you know, you have may have heard the phrase, don't wave the rubber chicken or something like that, like a superstition type thing. Mm -hmm. But that's where they, they essentially get it from. They'll... they'll wave a chicken over their head, it'll put all the sins of the people onto the chicken, and then they'll slit the throats of the chicken, kill the chicken, that's it. Now, is that biblical in any way? No. But the reason that the, the ultra-Orthodox uh, have done that, have found that out, is because there is hints of uh, a biblical nature in it, which is that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. That's what we believe. It's what we as Christians, what we as believers believe as well. We believe it's the blood of Yeshua that was shed, not just the blood of a uh, chicken, um, but that, that's where they get it from. Now, most of the wide stream Jewish community would say, as after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, that our, our ability to repent and sacrifice has changed. And now instead, because there's no temple, we can't do a blood sacrifice, which means our sacrifice comes through prayer and repentance. And that's what uh, most, the most commonly like, widespread belief would be that that's how we uh, find the forgiveness of sins, through prayer, through repentance, through afflicting ourselves, through this fasting, through observing and obeying God, we are able to, to create a right relationship with him and be written in the book of life. But it's very interesting because the ultra-Orthodox, even though it may seem crazy that they're waving this chicken and putting the sins on this chicken and then, and then killing the chicken, it actually is biblical in the sense that you can't just have forgiveness by prayer. You need the shedding of blood. If, if we could just have forgiveness by prayer, then why would, why would Jesus have had to come and die and shed his blood? He wouldn't have had to because we could have just come and preached and we could have all prayed and then we'd all be saved. So it's an interesting, uh, those, those uh, hidden truths that are hidden in some of the traditions. Now, what scriptures do they read over the holiday? Um, there, there are a lot of scriptures that are read. A lot of them are scriptures of uh, lamentation and repentance as well. And there's a variety of those. Different synagogues would read uh, different kinds of those. But the biggest thing that they go through are these uh, different, I think there's 18 different uh, types of repentance. And as they focus on each one, each one examining a different part of the human heart, that's, they, they, by the time you get to the end, then you will have, in their minds, rid yourself of all sin. And even the ones that you haven't known to say, you will say that. The final thing they say at the end, at the very end of the day, is something called all vows. And it's in Hebrew, it's all vows. And it's a song, usually it's chanted and sung. And that's this prayer to God releasing them, releasing us from all of the vows we made, knowingly, unknowingly, vows are promises, commitments, things that we didn't do, times we didn't keep our word, that he would release all the vows we've made to God and to others, release us from those so that we're not held against us in a guilt way. You can really see Jesus in this, script, in this uh, holiday, can't you? Absolutely. I think it's one of, the, one of the holidays that we can most see Jesus because it's the day of atonement. And what did Jesus do but to come to atone for our sins. And it's really the one time of year where, we, where the Jewish people and Judaism focuses 
on repentance and atonement and the forgiveness of sins, which is so central to what we believe and what Yeshua came to teach. Now, during Yom Kippur many years ago, the Arab nations attacked Israel, and it was strategically one of the best times to attack, wasn't it? Because there's no television, there's no radio, no one's on the telephone. A great time to attack. Ab- absolutely. I mean, it, it's the time when everyone shuts down, and it's not even just a holiday celebratory. Like, cars shut down, buses shut down, communication systems. Most people have their phones off. I mean, even people that aren't religious, they would, they would observe Yom Kippur. A lot of them would. Similar to how some nominal Christians, you know, they'd go to church on Christmas and Easter. Uh, that, it's one of those days where it's just like, even, even if I don't believe on not driving on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, on Yom Kippur, I'm definitely not going to drive because you might get a rock thrown at you, People, especially if you're in a more religious city like Jerusalem. So back in the day, uh, I think it was in the 70s, uh, there was the Yom Kippur War, which is most notable for the fact that Israel was attacked on Yom Kippur and trying to mobilize people who most of them have their communication systems offline, not thinking of anything. It gave the enemy uh, a, a big advantage in those days. So the country's under attack, but nobody knows about it because no one communicates. Exactly, exactly. Mm. And even the idea of like hearing guns on Yom Kippur would be a, a very uh, a sacrilegious thought for a lot of people. Mm. What's your prayer for the Jews during Yom Kippur? You know, I think Yom Kippur is the one day of year where the Jewish people is the Israeli nation most have this sensitivity, this uh, awareness of God and sin. And so the prayer uh, in my heart would be that that veil would come off and that we would see, man, the Bible does talk about blood, the shedding of blood needed for the forgiveness of sins. And we don't need to go and do that with a chicken. But, but God's provided a way for us to do that, 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 that those blinders would come off of that, that, re, that repentance, that uh, contrite heart. I know that God loves a contrite heart, a broken reed he won't crush, a contrite heart he won't despise. And so as that very real contrite heart is upon our people, that, that, uh, that they would see who is our actual high priest, who does go in before God, not just one day a year, but every day is constantly in the presence of God, interceding on our behalf. That it doesn't just have to be a one day a year reality. This, this new covenant uh, reality that we get to live in is available and actually belongs first and foremost to the Jewish people. And so we as uh, believers from the nations have been grafted into that, have inherited from their promises, from their covenant. But this is a reality that God always intended for his people to have, that they would have a high priest that would continually come before his throne. And the fact that there's no temple today and there's no blood sacrifice today does not mean that there's no forgiveness of sins because we have forgiveness in Jesus as our Messiah. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Thank you.